The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. It may be quick and easy, but it's also the most boring path to take. In our schools, in our society, in our workplaces, we have been misinformed that there's only one path, one correct answer to any given question. And I call this the single solution syndrome. I prefer to take a winding scenic route, just like Billy from the fa family circus. When his mom asks him to go straight out the door, instead he travels all around the house, jumping up and down, under and over, all around, covering every square inch of the house before he heads out. When you take a meandering, serendipitous route like this, you get to stop along the way and discover, you get to question, learn, evolve, connect, and unearth things along the way. In any creative endeavor, there's no single solution to any problem. As an architect, I approach different designs using many different methods, and there's no single way of doing. Every design is like an experiment. Multiple ways can be simultaneously and equally rewarding. And we don't even pretend to know the right answer, because everything is trial and error. I'd like to share with you today five very different approaches that we've taken with the design process in five different projects. The first one is, begin with the question. We asked, what is a mosque? We were asked to design a mosque or a, a small prayer space in the parking garage of an old apartment building which was already existing to cater to elderly residents of the building who couldn't visit the mosque during Ramadan to offer additional prayers. And we faced three major challenges, time, space, and budget. We identified that the mosque in its purest form is just a ground plane and a wall in front to show the direction. We were able to complete this project from conception to realization within two weeks. What we wanted to design was a very bare, white, minimalistic kind of mosque with kind of soft textures and soft surfaces. We studied the kind of uh, geometry that was used in Islamic architecture and we developed this frame. And then we started applying the techniques from tailoring to architecture. So we used fabric to cover this frame, which is called the mihrab. This wall is called the mihrab. And uh, we created this kind of tufted surface, somewhat like a back of a sofa. And in fact, we used sofa makers to stitch this in place. And there are so many interesting details in this surface, like the tufts, the creases, the pleats, and um, you know, so many different details that make this surface very interesting and make it more complex than it already is. You can see some of the details here. This is a cross stitch which we used to connect the fabric onto the, onto the frame. And this forms like an undulating mathematical surface, a very complex geometry. As the light plays over the surface, it creates all these dips and all these tucks they create all these light and shadow kind of effects which are very dramatic and at the same time it's a very minimalistic kind of design. Second is learn from precedent. We were commissioned to design a small commercial kitchen for a health food delivery startup in Hyderabad. Since it's a very large workspace, it reminded us of factories. So we looked at factory architecture as inspiration. The typical factory uh, vocabulary of the roof is this kind of serrated uh, sawtooth kind of a roof which has strips of windows on the top. And generally these strips are there because they face the north and they bring in north light into the center of the building. And this is 
used to light up large span spaces. North light is not only good for health, but it's also very condu conducive to work and productivity. We reinterpreted the same model and created a sloped roof for the kitchen, and we gave it a sort of twist. And at every step, we gave it different twists. So we divided the roof structure into different planes. <clears throat> and each plane was separated from the previous one, and it created a sort of sliver in between the planes, which would let the north light in, into the sloped roof. So according to Vastu Shastra, we're supposed to be lifting the south side. So the south side of the roof was supposed to be elevated. So we did this by just lifting this, the roof up, and then we were able to carve out this mezzanine level on top, where we situated the office space, which would be used for uh, supervision of the workers within working in the kitchen. Let ideas evolve and mutate. I read about the divine inspiration of the NBA. I read that whenever um, a basketballer kind of at his peak when he makes a shot, he thinks about all his training and everything that he has undergone and everything that he's ever learned. And then in the last moment, at the same time, he just forgets everything and then makes the basket. And this is how every creative endeavor can be done. So I've been really intrigued by this material ever since I learned about it. It's called fiberglass, and uh, it's primarily used in architectural um, uh, purposes, such as skylights and even in model making. But I used it for the design of laser cut wearables. I was really inspired by this building, uh, which is called the turning torso. So it seems to go twisting around as it goes up. As you can see in the plan, the plan is sort of very peculiar and twisted at every step. And I've adapted this into the design of a wearable, which has many layers of fiberglass, which are going on twisting at different angles as they go. <clears throat> the structure of a bird's wing inspired this ring, the wing ring. And tentacles of an octopus kind of took shape in this tangle bangle. So we created a whole series of wearables in this material. Thank you. Adding light really adds another dimension to this material. Um, so the way that light travels to, through this material is that it has this fiber optic quality to it. So when you light one edge of the material, all the cut edges get lit. So it gives a very kind of surreal feeling to it. So we created this design of this lamp. And as you can see in the, in the layers, so we layered the lamp, uh, the pieces, in such a way that they're staggered. So the light is kind of lighting up all the edges, and you get, you get this kind of silhouette. We were commissioned to uh, design a business center in this space at Rajiv Gandhi International Airport. So we had to replace this structure, which is already there. And we designed something using the same material. This is what we proposed in fiberglass. And the profile of the material, uh, profile of the roof is such that it's very streamlined. So it mimics the pathways of uh, flights, the kind of routes that they take. And the roof design somewhat seems to, at different points, it seems to take off and it seems to land. Uh, and light adds character to this design. And what we proposed was that the entire business center would be a transparent building, which is not really, uh, which is visually uh, lightweight and not really visible from a distance. And then you would only see the lines of light and as you approach it. Make improbable connections. Sherlock Holmes said, once you eliminate the improbable, whatever remains, no matter how, sorry, once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable it is, that must be the truth. And we had to do a lot of improbable decisions um, in this design. So uh, for this, we had to design a public art installation for a street art festival in Dubai. 
And the challenge was that we had to design an installation which we wouldn't build, but it should be built by visitors who would be visiting the festival over a period of 10 days. So how do you get people who have never worked with design before, uh, people who may be of all ages and different backgrounds, how do you, they're basically strangers, so how do you get them to connect together and form an art installation and build it um, over a period of 10 days? That was one challenge. The second challenge was that <clears throat> this, uh, the budget that was allotted to this project was very, very tight, tight by Dubai standards. But since I'm an Indian, I converted it to rupees and I felt that it was very, it was kind of luxurious. So um, I designed this piece. It was a flat piece with grooves in it. And you could interlock two pieces to one another and it would become three-dimensional. So you would go along interlocking all these different pieces together. And again, there are no rules of, uh, of connection or of aggregation. And anyone could just pick up a piece and put it together. There's no right or wrong way of doing it. So I did a few experiments computationally. I was able to uh, kind of uh, populate these basic units and predict how they would behave when they grew. And the entire project was done by um, within a week, I traveled from Dubai to Hyderabad. I sourced local raw material and cheap local labor helped me to ma mass produce all these little pieces and then put them together, we packed them up and I took them along with me uh, on my flight back to Dubai and, um, and I paid for 35 kgs of excess baggage but I still did the job in half the budget. So this is our setup and um, it was very intuitive and it was very self-explanatory. People just had to come, pick up the pieces, and start building. So people of all ages and all backgrounds came together and they built this installation. There were little boys and big boys all working together, and they built this installation incrementally over a period of 10 days and nights. It truly was a crowdsourced art installation. This was on day five. Unearth what's already within. Sometimes with some projects, all you need to do is connect the dots. Michelangelo said, the sculpture is already complete within the block of marble. All I need to do is remove the superfluous material and kind of set it free. This project is just like that. So this is the Golconda Fort as seen from our site. This is the fort as in the satellite image as seen from above. You can see the fort wall and this is our site smack dab in the middle of Golconda. We were asked to design a charity school which would cater to the, the children from disadvantaged backgrounds in the heart of Golconda. This is the surrounding context. So as you can see, all the buildings are very colorfully painted. They're, there's a very dense kind of environment, so low-rise buildings of high density, all courtyard houses which are sharing walls with one another. And the lanes are quite narrow and uh, very steep because it's on a hill and lots of goats everywhere. So this is the, this is the plan. Uh, there was a mosque already existing there, which was an old building, and there was a school uh, which was housed in like a big shed, um, which wasn't really designed. It was just, just a big hall with partitions. And the, the interesting part was that the site was somewhat divided into two parts. Um, vertically, so there was an upper level which was at a, fee, at a height of 20 feet above the lower level. This is the site and as you can see on the left side there is this wall of rock which is kind of dividing the two sides. That's me. So this was the cliff that was uh, dividing the two sides, and you can see the upper and the lower level in this diagram here. So there's two axes to this uh, to the site. 
one from, all from the road that is winding around, but it goes up the hill. So one from below and one from above. This is the view from above. You've got the playground. This is what used to be the playground. On the left side was the existing school and the majestic Golconda Fort in the background, which surrounds and envelops the entire school on all sides. So you've got, even on this side, you've got Golconda Fort in the background and the school in the foreground. And the children here are used to a very informal kind of atmosphere. Uh, they're used to climbing these rocks and mountains, and they're used to learning outdoors and under trees sometimes. However, uh, their classroom existing environment was dark, dingy, and it was quite dull and uninspiring. So we wanted to design something that was much more interesting for them. The site itself dictated the kind of form that the building would take. So uh, this is uh, the building that is there. And um, you have two axes, one from the ground floor and one from the second floor. And the building kind of binds the two floors together. We picked colors from the surrounding palette of the context, and we applied them in a very controlled manner throughout the school in pops of color. So the gate is yellow. And, and then we kept the, the facade and all the walls of the building uh, deliberately blank in exposed concrete. One, because exposed concrete doesn't require much of maintenance. And the other reason is that we wanted to negate the very bright colors of all the other buildings in this context. This is how it looks. Um, I mean, this is how we envisioned it. Pops of color throughout. And uh, this school is something that, uh, what's really unique about this building is that you would experience it from the inside out, unlike other buildings. This is the central staircase which forms, which is bright red and it forms the spine of the building and it connects the ground floor, the first floor and the second floor all in one line. And the rock kind of embraces, is embraced by the school and the school grows around it rather than destroying the rock that it's naturally existing. So the rock becomes a living part of the school. And because this uh, project was so difficult, the site was so difficult, uh, we had to do a lot of design on site. So all these sketches and things happened on site, and we had to do the design while uh, it was under construction. And we took some inspiration from the courtyard concept uh, of the vernacular houses, and we created this triple height atrium, two of them, which would bring in li natural light from the top of the building right into the heart of the building. And that's the central staircase again. So every part of the building is naturally ventilated, and uh, there is no need for artificial ventilation or cooling anywhere. And it's really heartening to see the students using the spaces in a very you know, innovative and kind of unpredictable manner. The reason why we have steps here is because there was rock jutting out from below. So we covered it with steps and created an informal seating in the library. And the students are attending school now. Sometimes the goats are also attending. The perforated wall above, it brings in natural uh, light and it brings in cool air and keeps out the, the heat from the north. And this is uh, how it is right now. The, the roof is under construction, so this is how it would look, the skylight would look after it's complete. This is how it was. Uh, this is how the students you know, like to use it. They like to use the external spaces as well. The old schoolhouse has undergone a transformation. And this is how it was two years ago, and this is it today. So we started this campaign uh, online called Make Progress Possible. Uh, so we wanted to collect used books for the school library, but people started also making uh, monetary donations, which went into funding the school building, and it's for a good cause. In the words of Robert Frost, two, two roads diverged in a wood and I. I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Which path would you take? I hope you choose the fun one. Thank you. <laughs>